Historical Jesus, Part 4, Baptism and Temptations Before he began his ministry, Jesus first had to receive John's baptism and then overcome Satan's temptations. After briefly explaining his baptism, we'll go into detail exploring why Satan's temptations were so tempting, as well as what we can learn from Jesus' example. How does Jesus defeat Satan where Eve failed? If you'd like to watch a video of this class or download the course notes, visit restitutio.org. The Historical Jesus, Part 4, Baptism and Temptations. Please turn to Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist was an unusual man. He was a wildly successful prophet. A lot of the prophets we read about in the Bible are very unsuccessful. Either they end up killed or unpopular. John the Baptist had a strong message. He preached it with vigor and people responded well. We read about him in Matthew chapter 3. He preached repentance in light of God's coming kingdom. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at verse 4. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. John the Baptist was like Elijah. We read about Elijah in 2 Kings, and it says about Elijah that he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And somebody describes Elijah in such a way, and the other person replies, oh, that's Elijah the Tishbite. In other words, Elijah dressed in a distinctive way that got people's attention, and part of that had this garment of hair and a belt of leather. In Malachi chapter 4, we find this prophecy, it says, In verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And so John the Baptist was, like I said, an unusual person. He was like Elijah. Elijah, if you read about him, he was an unusual person as well. And so his way of life was quite different than Jesus, but Jesus had a very high opinion of John the Baptist. And we read the most about this in Matthew chapter 11, where it says in verse 7, As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. That's quite a statement, isn't it? This is Jesus. Jesus is saying... As far as people born of women, it's like, who, who, who is not born of a woman here? Like, everyone, right? John the Baptist is the best, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days, verse 12, of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. And so Jesus considers that John the Baptist fulfills that Elijah prophecy, that he he didn't just dress like him, but he was fulfilling the Elijah prophecy of turning people's hearts back to God before the day of judgment would come. Verse 15, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. 
The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Back to Matthew chapter 3. And so what we see from this is that John's style of ministry was different than Jesus. Jesus, John was an ascetic. He, He did not enjoy eating bread, and he did not drink wine, and he, he was uh, lived out in the wilderness. Jesus, you find him at dinner parties all the time, right? And uh, Jesus is very social, very engaged with the people. John's sort of like this out-of-nowhere guy that proclaims repentance, and people respond to him. But that shows me that, you know, you can have different styles, and God can work with you, The message between the two, if you look at it, is still the same message. And so we look at verse uh, 11 there, Matthew 3.11, where John preaches. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So this is John's primary prophecy about Jesus. The prophecy is a prophecy of judgment. Jesus is going to have this winnowing fork, which is kind of like a large pitchfork, and he's going to lift up the wheat and toss it into the air, and as it comes down, the heavier good grains are going to gather in a pile, and the chaff is going to blow off to the side, and he's going to gather the the grain, which is the righteous people, into his barn, and the chaff he's going to burn in this fire. That's the unrighteous people. So his prophecy is like, hey, you guys are responding to me, and that's great, but there's one coming that's way greater than me. And this one is going to change some things, that's for sure. That's a very soft way of saying it. He's going to bring judgment on the righteous and the unrighteous. Verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting For us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I asked myself, why does Jesus go to John for baptism? What's What's the point of that? Uh, there are many scriptures that tell us that it wasn't because of a need to repent or a, a, an issue of sin in his life. And I, I don't honestly have full clarity on that. All I know is that Jesus said, thus it is fit, fitting to fulfill righteousness, to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, Jesus is saying, John, let's just go through with this because this is the right thing for me to do right now. And That, to me, shows a level of humility. I mean, here's somebody that's prophesied and destined to rule the world. I mean, that's bigger than Pontius Pilate and his little governorship of Judea. That's bigger than Antipas and his realm of Galilee and Perea. That's way bigger than Tiberius, even, in his throne in Rome, right? Jesus is destined to rule the whole world, and yet look at the humility of this man. To go to someone else, especially some person like John the Baptist, who's just kind of like a wild card, and and submit to him um, in this way, he just trusts in God. You know, in the time of Jesus, there are all these different sects. You know, we wouldn't quite call them denominations, but different takes on Judaism. You had the Sadducees, you had the Pharisees, you had the Essenes, you had the Zealots, you had... Uh, chief priests, usually part of the Sadducees, and then you had John the Baptist and his charismatic renewal movement out in the desert. And who does, who does God authorize? Who, who, does, who does God, who's really God working with? And God has his son, Jesus, go and say, it's John, John the Baptist. 
That's the message that is true. And so there's no mention of how this is going to affect Jesus. He, Jesus is not concerned about how this will look to his constituency. He's not worried that this might hurt his popularity or that that might put him in the shadow of John the Baptist. He's not worried about how to distinguish himself from John to show that he's different. He's his own man. Vote for Jesus. There's none of that, is there? He just does it. He's humble. He doesn't even make a big speech. You know who makes the speech? God. When God speaks from heaven, it grabs my attention because it's so rare. I mean, I've read this book cover to cover, and there, there are only a handful of times when God does that sort of thing. There's the Ten Commandments, right? When the people are at Mount Zion, or sorry, Mount Sinai, and God speaks the Ten Commandments, and the people all run away. They just, don't, they just can't handle it. You know, you have a couple of other times here and there, but it's, it's like God Himself can't contain it. And He just sort of breaks the silence and says, this is my beloved Son. You know, there's probably a line of people there. He points it out, this is my, He sends the Holy Spirit like a dove. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I love that. I love how God does that. And then, right after this, Jesus goes head to head with the serpent. It says that the Spirit drove him into the desert. And he was there for 40 days. Not the evil spirit, but the Holy Spirit drove him into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 days. Satan had tempted Eve with such subtlety. If you remember from Genesis chapter 3, she didn't recognize what was happening until it was way too late. Satan said to her, this is back in the Garden of Eden, Satan had said to her, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? I mean, think about how clever that is. First of all, it's a question. A question is always better than just a statement. He could have said to her, God's not letting you eat from this one tree, huh? What a jerk. He could have said that. Instead, he says, tell me, Eve, can you eat from any tree? Do you have freedom? Can you do whatever you want? And she's like, well, let me tell you what she said. She said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. At which point, Satan says, you surely will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The message is simple. God's holding you back. He knows that if you eat from that tree, you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. He doesn't want you to have that. Take it. You're not going to die. He just made the universe. He just made people. He's not going to kill you. Just eat from the tree, right? And the more you think about it, the more you ponder satanic temptations the more they gain traction in your soul. The more you start to doubt yourself, and you're like, whoa, geez, that's a really good point, right? And so when she saw it was good for food and a delight to the eyes and make her wise, she took and ate and gave to her husband, and he ate. And so that's basically how humanity did the first time we faced off with Satan. There was one round, and we lost. And... Satan's goal in that instance, and, I, and I, I see this also when he goes against Jesus, his goal is to break your trust in God. That's it. It's that simple. You have your trust in God, and if he could just break that, if he could just snap that, he's got you. You're done. He already wins. And so, so long as she believed that what God said was the right thing, and that it was good, and it wasn't to hold her back, and it wasn't to ruin her life, she was going to be okay, right? And as soon as she, she went away from that, and then Adam went away from that, now we're in chaos, and the world has fallen, and we're all well aware of that today. Satan is not some minor mythical creature in Scripture. He is called the god of this age, the ruler of this world, the deceiver of the whole world, the prince of the power of the air, the one who has been sinning from the beginning, and the one who prowls around like a roaring lion, 
seeking someone to devour. Satan is behind the curtain pulling the strings. He is the tainting and corrupting influence in the world. The malevolent force behind Herod, the wickedness infecting Antipas, the puppet master behind Pilate's brutality. He works tirelessly to spoil and ruin goodness and to twist and bend everything away from God's will. Satan is evil. And you don't see much about him in Scripture until the time of Christ. I mean, you, you, obviously you see what is there in Genesis 3 that I just recited to you. And there are a couple of other incidents. But it's really at the time of Christ that Satan is unmasked for who he really is. And that begins to happen with these temptations. So there are three temptations of Christ. And we read about them in Matthew chapter 4. So flip over Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So what's he after here? He's not after hunger. Jesus, he's using the hunger. But he's after, he's, his question is, are, if you are the Son of God, right? That's the question. If you are the Son of God, turn the stone into bread. Now, is it a sin to turn stone into bread? There's no commandment in Scripture that says, thou shalt not turn stones into bread. Not like it's a typical thing that happens anyhow, but there's, there's no commandment against it. Uh, and it wouldn't even necessarily be a sin to prove that He is the Son of God. In fact, we see throughout the preaching, especially in the book of Acts, that everyone wants to show and witness and testify and prove that Jesus is the Son of God based on the resurrection. And so that's not even necessarily a sin either. But what happens when He commands a stone to turn bread and God says no? What happens then? Who knows, right? Is, I thought I was the Son of God, and I, I tried to do it, and it, it didn't work. Or what, what happens if He doesn't command the stone to become bread, and then He never knows for sure, because He didn't try? You know, and it's, it's the, the nature of these, the subtlety of these temptations. The more you ponder it, the more you're like, whether He does it or He doesn't do it, either way, His soul is filling with doubt. Because it's like, well, if I am the Son of God, then yes, I should be able to prove it to Satan, send him slithering back where he came from. That's the direct approach, right? Or the indirect approach, I'm not going to fall for that. I am the Son of God, and I don't need to prove to anybody, I think. <laughs> right? Like, no matter which way you go with it, it's, it, you know, it, this is not a, a naive creature we're talking about here, the devil. And so, what does Jesus do? Matthew 4, 4, but he answered... It is written, and I don't get the impression Jesus gave it a lot of thought or a lot of time, that it was, it is written. In other words, this is what the Bible says. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knew his Bible. He's quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 8. It says in Deuteronomy 8, 2, And you shall remember the whole way that Yahweh your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, and he might, that He might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. And He humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that He might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, of Yahweh. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. There were 40 days that spies, once, once the children of Israel got to the promised land, they, they sent in spies. Those spies were there for 40 days. The spies came back. They gave a negative report. They said the land is a good land, but there's no way we can take it. And Israel revol revolted against God and Moses in that moment. And so the punishment was to have 40 years wandering in the desert, in the wilderness. I say desert instead of wilderness because when we think of wilderness, we think of rainforest. And when an Israelite thinks of wilderness, they think of desert. So anyhow, but they got 40 years for wandering and refusing to enter the land. So now here's Jesus, and he's not eaten for 40 days. 
he's going through this wilderness experience, right? Where he's hungry and he's tempted. And that stone, actually, in their culture, those stones would look like bread, especially after 40 days of not eating, right? And the manna economy, what God established with Israel during that 40 years, was that this is not about the food people. It's about trust. You trust me, every day there's going to be manna there for you. On the sixth day, there'll be twice as much manna. On the seventh day, none. Right? I mean, it's not just some sort of natural process here. It's a supernatural going on that we're talking about here. And Jesus is living this. He's in that moment. He's hungry. He's facing it. And he's being tempted to doubt God. And he won't do it. He says, no. Man shall not live by... It's not about the bread. It's about every word that comes out of God's mouth. And in that moment, he says, I trust God. I trust Him. That He's going to take care of me. I trust Him that He's going to take care of me. Um, Then the second temptation comes around. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. It's my devil voice there. It's kind of a funny thing to say, right? If you're the Son of God, jump. It's, it, it, we'll get to it. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Here, the tempter quotes the Bible to Jesus. So this is round two. Eve, did, Eve only made it one round. I don't even know what happened to Adam. But Jesus is now on round two. This is like uncharted territory. Satan's quoting the Bible back at Jesus now. Right? And again, meditate for me for a moment on the subtlety of this. Look how adaptable Satan is. All right. Prove you're the Son of God. God won't let you die. You're the Son of God. Your destiny is to rule the world. He's not going to let you die. Right? Right? If you're really the Son of God, He's not going to let you die. In fact, the Scripture says, if you you are about to die, if you're about to hit your foot against us, He's going to send an angel to bear you up. That's what it says, Jesus. Jump. Jump. Don't be afraid to jump. You say you have faith in Him. You say you trust Him. Oh, man does not live by bread alone, yada, yada, yada. Prove it. How much faith do you have in this God? Because until you, until you jump, until you throw your life in, in, you know, at risk, you're just, it's just all words, Jesus. Right? I mean, you can see the intensity of this request. I mean, Jesus is standing on the top of the temple and he's looking down. And all he has to do is either jump or not jump. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written... You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The full quote of that, again, it's a quote from Deuteronomy, is from 6.16. It says, You shall not put Yahweh your God to the test as you tested Him at Masa. That little part at the end. As you tested Him at Masa is not uh, in, in the quote we have from here, but it's in the, the um, context of the original that he's pulling from. And so likely also in his mind. So the question is, well, what happened at Masa? What's going on here? Exodus chapter 17 says, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. So this is, again, back to that 40 years in the desert wandering, and there's no water to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Why do you think this scripture was in Jesus' mind? Maybe because he's in a desert and he has no water to drink and it's been 40 days? You know, I mean, like these scriptures were just like right there, right when Satan went for it. And Moses said to him, or said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? my complaint voice. So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and taking your hand the staff 
with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. Problem solved. Go to God. Solves a problem. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel. And now this is the important part. Because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Is Yahweh with us or not? Is God with us here in the desert or are we alone? That's the question. That's the test. That's not the test for them. That's the test to God. It says, um, the scripture was, You shall not put Yahweh your God to the test as you tested Him at Massa. They tested Him. They said, Are you with us or not? And so here you have Jesus. Is God with me or not? That's the question he has to ask himself. Is God with him? Well, if God's with him, then he should jump. Right? Because God will take care of him. No! (laughs) Don't jump. Jumping off temple, like, look, if you take anything from tonight, don't jump off the top of a building. You know, just don't do it. It's a bad idea. That's the question Jesus is unwilling to ask. He trusts that God is with him. He shuts the temptation down. He doesn't let it run wild in his mind until he's paralyzed and he doesn't know what to do. He shuts it down. He recognizes for what it is. Satan is doing the same thing as before. He's trying to drive a wedge between the person and God. That's what he wants to do. He wants to break the trust. If you can break the trust, you're on your own. And you can't take Satan. None of us can. Not even together as a big group conferring with each other and strategizing. We still, he's just too, he's too old. He's been around too long, right? We need God. God for, for God, it's just like, flick. It's no big deal for God. So we have to trust, we have to plug in and trust God. And then we're, that's what Jesus does. He's the representative Israelite facing the wilderness temptation, and he trusts in God rather than putting him to the test like they did. He's like, I am not doing that. All right. I want to show you some of these scriptures about Jesus being the Son of God. Now, when when I say Son of God, most of us probably think it means there was a miracle with Mary, such that he's literally, if we want to put it, like his biological father, right? But the, the phrase Son of God is bigger than that, is bigger than that. In 2 Samuel, this is the promises that God made. uh, These are the promises God made to David, if you remember from uh, before. When your days are fulfilled, 2 Samuel 7, 12, when your days are fulfilled, David, that you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. See that phrase, a son? So, to, for God to be Father to him, to, in other words, to be the Son of God from this original promise that God makes to David is to be the one that God seats on the throne of David. And you, and you see there is this if a, a political overtone to the phrase Son of God. It's not just talking about biology. What it's talking about is rank and status and the right to rule. And so we see this and a number of other, I just want to show you these scriptures. Luke 1.32 says, He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The very next thing, And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Matthew 26.63 But Jesus remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. You see, it's like almost in the same breath. The Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, Luke 4.41, and demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. So there you have it again, Son of God interchanged with Christ. Or Nathaniel in John 1.49 says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Once again, interchanging Son of God with King of Israel. Uh, or John eleven twenty seven, 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. 
All right, we must uh, press on so we don't run out of time. The third temptation of Christ. So anyhow, my point about the Son of God business is that when Satan says, if you are the Son of God, he's not simply saying, is God really your Father? He's saying, are you the one destined to rule the world? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really God's one that He has chosen to take over everything? Which is what makes sense of this last temptation, Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Satan here offers Jesus everything. You can have it all. Just fall down and worship me. I'll give it all to you. All the kingdoms of the world. Shortcut. You know, buy now, pay later. Go for it. I mean, of course Jesus would be a better ruler than Satan, right? And wouldn't it be self-sacrificial for him to sin once so that the rest of us could live under Jesus as king instead of Satan? Right? I mean, you can see how these doubts must have... Uh, been right there on the surface. But Jesus shut it down, right? Verse 10. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Jesus doesn't give him an inch. Once again, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema, the great creed of ancient Israel and modern Jews as well. And it says in Deuteronomy 6, It is Yahweh your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. By His name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For Yahweh your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of Yahweh your God be kindled against you and He destroy you from the fa- off the face of the earth. Whoa. <laughs> right? And so, yeah... For a moment, he gets the kingdoms of this world. But then in the next moment, God destroys him off the face of the earth. That would do a lot of good, right? So Jesus is is pulling right from this. And he's saying, look, I'm not going to serve another God. I'm committed to the one true God. I don't care what you give me. Again, he has to simply trust that God's plan is the best plan. And that doing it God's way is the only way that's going to work. And that's what he does. Eve is in a desert, or Eve is in a garden. Jesus is in a desert. Eve has a full belly with plenty of food. Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days. Eve goes one round. Jesus goes three rounds. She enjoyed paradise with no sin. Jesus grew up in the world of the Herods. Having gone three rounds, Jesus defeats Satan. I want to close with this quotation. I mean, just think about how magnificent Jesus is compared to the rulers of his age, right? Here's somebody offering Jesus everything, and he says, no, I want to do it God's way. This is N.T. Wright. He says, Jesus responds to the devil not by attempting to argue. Arguing with temptation is often a way of playing with the idea until it becomes too attractive to resist but by quoting Scripture. The passages he draws on come from the story of Israel in the wilderness. He is going to succeed where Israel failed. Physical needs and wants are important, but loyalty to God is more important still. Jesus is indeed to become the world's true Lord, but the path to that status and the mode of it when it arrives is humble service, not a devilish seeking after status and power. Trusting God doesn't mean acting stupidly to force God into doing a spectacular rescue. The power that Jesus already has, which He will shortly display in healings in particular, is to be used for restoring others to life and strength, not for cheap stunts. His status as God's Son commits Him not to showy prestige, but to the path, the strange path of humility, service, and finally death. The enemy will return to test this resolve again, for the moment, an initial victory is, is, own, is won and Jesus can begin his public career knowing that though struggles lie ahead, the foe has been beaten on the first field that really matters. And so we'll look at Jesus' inaugural sermon and how he begins his ministry. This is all pre-ministry. Now that this is done, he will begin uh, preaching and teaching and healing.
If you enjoyed what you heard here, why not give Restitutio a five-star rating in iTunes or Stitcher? Doing so will help others find this podcast and inspire them to love God, follow Christ, and seek truth wherever it leads. Thanks for listening, and check us out online at restitutio.org, where you can find an archive of all the podcasts, as well as a bunch of articles and links to other resources. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.